Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. And thank you, young ladies, for a beautiful blessing in music. And, um, well, how are you? Are you are you remembering your blessings today? Amen. Amen. You know, these past few weeks for myself, I've had some family members struggling with mental health. And uh, that kind of brings up your past, right? Because they grew up with you. <laughs> they know the inside secrets. They know. They know a lot about you. But that was the past. That was before uh, so much of my life has been lived. And so that kind of weighed on my thoughts as I was trying to think about how can I present something that is edifying to my brothers and sisters and how I can, um, you know, just, just try and, and share the word, preach the word, share the, the truth of the gospel uh, and have it actually mean something. And so I pray that you will, um, I pray that you'll be blessed today. You know, some of these scripture passages are kind of long and I've been thinking about that. And um, I think it's important that we can read long passages of scripture and grab the, the nuggets, see the blessings and the you know, recognize the challenges that people have gone through and still uh, see the victory that God has given. But before I begin, let's bow our heads together one more time as, uh, as I begin in prayer. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for this blessed day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here together. And Father, I pray that you would speak through me Father, my hope is that uh, I could share a meaningful truth that has blessed me and that will bless others here today. Father, I pray that as we see from your word uh, that we could find uh, a resting place. Father, that we could find a shelter of grace, of love and kindness. And Father, that we can look forward by faith uh, to the astounding blessings that you have set aside for your faithful children. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you, send your spirit to bless it and help us to take it with us from this place uh, out into the community, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, has anyone here made some bad decisions? <laughs> Sometimes our past can have some long-term consequences, right? Uh, boy, sometimes we really, we get, uh, we get to learn something, right? And, um, you know, I think about what God has done in the past, and he, he helps us to learn in those situations, and he tries to steer us, right, into the way into the straight and narrow where we can be sheltered, we can be guided, and we can be blessed. You know, God is going to lead us to an eternity where there's no sorrow about what has happened. There's no sorrow. We've learned by God's grace, we've overcome, and uh, there's no sorrow in eternity. And so I want to encourage us as we think about this today, um, you know, the title that I've, I've written, Your Past Has Passed. God's past leads on. What God has done in the past will continue and continue throughout eternity. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. You know, as a process to get started, to, to think about how can I, um, as, a, as a sinner, how can I stand up here, right, and preach to you? 
well, I, I can't as a sinner, right? But I can as a child of the king. And that's what I seek to, to, to become again and again. Uh, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And so as I was thinking about how to share uh, what I could present, you know, um, I, I have a, a notebook that I write down uh, scriptures that come to mind or, or thoughts about how to express certain things. And I usually fill out a page and then, then I'll pick, you know, five or six out of that page of, of things that I've been asking the Lord about, how to share, how to present. And um, so what has happened in your past? That's a pretty big question. So I kind of want to look at three different aspects of what has happened in your past. Well, in my past, there's a historical heritage. And I'm sure some of you have the same as well. My mother's mother's father came over for the Yukon Gold Rush. And if the Yukon Gold Rush hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here today. And so Charles Engstrom emigrated from Sweden uh, in the 1896 era, and uh, he he went and he found gold, and and uh, then he got uh, a health condition, and so he couldn't stand the cold there anymore, and so he came down and he um, he settled in the Edmonds and Seattle area. And wouldn't you know, back in 1912, my mother's mother's mother almost came over on the Titanic but she didn't by God's grace there was something holding up the, her immigration status and so she couldn't make it from London to New York in 1912 but she went a little bit later and uh, wouldn't you know three years later my grandmother was born through Charles Engstrom There's a little bit of a snippet of a historical heritage. And I know each of you have different things that if you look back, you could see where historical significance happened and you have a heritage. When, you know, my, my uh, grandmother told Swedish and, uh, and my mother was an only child. And then wouldn't you know, I'm the second of seven children in the family. So another thing that happened in your past, and this is more personal, what brought you to recognize the love of God? Where were you? Each of us is different, right? We were in a different place, a different age, a different time. But where were you when you first realized and you recognized that God's grace is important for you? another part of your past. I remember where I was when I first believed. I was in Marysville at the Cruzy Brothers Church. And there were a small televangelist church there. And they would have altar calls and altar calls and altar calls all the time. But I know this one Sunday morning, I was lost. And I needed God's grace. And that invitation came. And I clung to it. And I have been blessed ever since. I've, I've learned more of the scripture. Uh, not been so afraid of being left behind anymore. But that's where I was in my past. When I first felt that grace. Uh, the joy of realizing God's love. Where were you? That's an important thing to hold on to, to remember. So where were you when you first believed? 
when the Spirit convicted you that you had a need? Do you remember it? I'm sure we all do. I don't, we don't really usually think about it very often. But it's kind of a spiritual milestone that I want to somewhat enshrine as a strong word, but have in import in our heart and in our recollection, remembrance. Where were you baptized? Right? When your, your life was officially given to the Lord, you were baptized in front of the church, and you made that commitment to serve God no matter what. So we believe we've got these spiritual milestones and I think all too often we forget to hype each other up about following God. Right? I think we're sometimes we're too stoic. <laughs> A lot of times I think we need more encouragement. You made it through the week. Praise God. God has been faithful. You've made it through these first four months of 2024. God has been with you. God wants to continue to lead you. There are important things that God has in store for not only me, but for you, for us, corporately. We have things in our past, but there is much more to look forward to, even in the very near future. So since you received the promise of the love of God, what successes do you celebrate? I think about the first time that I witnessed my answer to prayer. And it just kind of hit me like a truck. I had prayed and prayed and prayed and asked the Lord and, and you know, I... I fasted for a little while about this thing, and, and then the answer just right there. I saw answers to prayer. And I want to ask you, when have you seen those answers to prayer? And I want you to, again, not enshrine, but to memorialize the goodness of God, the answers to prayer that you have seen. I want to hype that up a little bit for you. Because it's not it doesn't happen every day. But when it happens, it is a huge blessing. You know, one time I was uh, a younger man working long hours in the family business, and I was exhausted. And I had taken our landscape truck down to the farm and I was dumping the truck, and uh, something happened. I don't know if I was partly stuck, or there was something, some debris in the way. I was exhausted and not thinking clearly, and, and finally the, the back of the truck came back down, the dump truck, and I almost got my arm stuck between the toolbox and the bed of the truck. And I was prompted, I believe, by an angel to move your hand. And I remember that so vividly that there again, there's a spiritual milestone that I have attained of, of God's mercy, his grace, quickening me so that I didn't get trapped down there at the farm with my arm pinned between the, the truck box and the dump bed. So there again, something that I have taken very personal. And I know many of you have had opportunities for angels to work on your behalf, to deliver you from trouble, to hold back some cause or effect. And there again, I want to I wanna hype it up a little bit because we forget so fast. <laughs> because the stresses of the week 
just life in general. But I want us to remember the many times that God has worked on, on our behalves. And I just want to encourage us to remember again. And for many of you, it's very personal. And I want to bring those things up in your mind this morning. Many of you have uh, been blessed as you look back when God said, no, don't do something. And you've been protected. You've been guided. You look back and you realize, wow, God is so good. I am so blessed that I listened to him and that I lived on principles and not on the whim of my emotion. But as we look back in life, we see how God only wants my best, our best. And so, we, I, again, I want to bring those things to mind. How God has been so faithful, delivered on our behalf, because we put him first. And I want to encourage us to do that again, again, as opportunities come. Put him first. Orient our life that we live in, live by character, and not so much by the vacillating whim of society. So, going through life, the things we've gone through have, have changed our mind and our motive a lot of times. The way you look back and you see how God has said yes, God has said no, God has uh, provided for me with this, God has sh saved me from that. As we think about those things, there's so much more coming. So much more. And I want to, once again, I want to recognize God's faithfulness, his goodness. And, and boy, it's, it's going to happen continuing this next week. His faithfulness is not going to change. And that opportunity that we have to be, um, to be the other part of that equation, right? God is constant. God is faithful. And we want to, uh, to be that way as well. So the things we've gone through have changed us. They've changed our minds. They've changed our, our motives, what we would do. How do you celebrate those as you continue right, walking by faith? Continue walking by faith because uh, you know Monday morning's coming and uh, not everyone here loves their job but we love the Lord right and the Lord loves you the Lord wants to help you uh, in all of your circumstance this first scripture I'd like to look at here is in Romans chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, starting verse 16, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What is faith to you? Is faith always hard? <laughs> I mean, sometimes it is, right? Faith is hard. But sometimes it is so easy just depends on your circumstance, right? It depends on uh, what you're going through. Faith can be so easy, and yet some other times it can seem near impossible to have faith, to believe, just be patient, just wait. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. The Lord has his plan. It may take 90 years, 
Be patient. Wait. Have faith. For in it this, the righteousness of Christ, verse 17, uh, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, Hebrews 11 tells us, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is, when, when the scripture talks about faith. And if you maybe this afternoon have the opportunity go through Hebrews 11 it talks about all of the faithful uh, sons and daughters of God the trials that they went through and yet they continued to believe and be unfazed um, by God's grace walking in faith so that's how we're supposed to live right by faith so that means we don't have to see and we don't have to have any substance. That's a challenge sometimes. That is a challenge. But you know it's less of a challenge if you are right with the Lord. He takes that opportunity for you to grow faith. not always removing that element of doubt, giving you the opportunity to decide. Who will I decide for? Will I decide wholeheartedly to follow the Lord, to be patient, to wait? Even though my heart wants something, the Lord says no. Will I obey? Will I follow? Will you, without the substance, have that faith? And I want to encourage you, please, have that faith. It's not always easy, but it is the best thing for us. The absolute best. It's not easy. But I guarantee you, it is worth it. And if you, well, again, look at Hebrews 11, you'll see all of these faithful servants of God. All right. So now we know we need to live by faith. And my faith tells me that Jesus is coming again. And boy, am I glad of that. Does your faith tell you that as well? Yes. Yes. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Do you by faith believe this passage? Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now this requires a change in us, doesn't it? How are we walking? This promise is dependent on how. How do we walk? Do we walk according to the flesh? Or do we follow the Spirit? Live in the Spirit? Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Amen. That doesn't mean we get off scot-free, right? <laughs> I'm free from the law, but only because the atoning blood of Jesus. That, that law that was broken, that mistake that I made, the decision that I made poorly, that I've asked for forgiveness of, I've been cleansed of, has been atoned by the precious blood of Christ. We're not getting off scot-free but the debt is paid and the promise is delivered on our behalf. As we are changed to be more Christ-like, we can walk and live in the spirit and not be subject to the whim of, of our flesh. Verse three, 
For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. Verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. So there is a change by God's grace. He equips us to walk by the Spirit and not be walking by the flesh. Do you believe there is no condemnation? The scripture here plainly says it. Amen. The scripture says it for us. And it's a it is a blessing. I mean, everyone here loves forgiveness, right? Everyone loves forgiveness. Everyone loves um, you know, when when two parties uh, can iron out their differences and be in harmony. Um, there's hardly anything better than that. I want to continue here in Romans chapter 8 and starting again in verse 11. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's kind of a mind-blowing idea. You think about the most vile among us, and I'm not discounting myself. The spirit of God breathing life into me. And so that I don't have to, uh, I don't have to live according to the flesh. And, and I'm actually invited to, to put the flesh to death. What a strange thought. To put my fleshly desires and ideas and, and uh, poor, poor ideas, to actually put them to, to death to live in the spirit of God. Continuing here, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Amen. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's what we had with the old way, right? The bondage, the spirit of fear. But now we receive something else. Verse 15 again. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we, what's that word? Suffer. That's a terrible word. Why is there a suffer in there? That's all part of it. Right? That's all part of it. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. By faith, do you believe that you are a joint heir with Christ? Amen. Why do I believe that? Because he gave everything on my behalf on your behalf. He gave it all 
to erase that division of sin in our hearts and lives. He gave everything so that we could become joint heirs and bless him. So I ask you, what has God promised from the beginning? If you were an heir, what, what, do, you, what do you feel we should inherit? <laughs> right? Eternal life? I mean, that's pretty dynamic. If we are joint heirs with Christ, you and I are invited to be joint heirs of Christ. Heirs of eternal life. But this inheritance is taking some time to come to fruition, isn't it? It's taking a little while. But let's look at where, where this started. And let's turn to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Looking a little bit about God's past, what God has done in the past. For you and I. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Genesis 12, 1 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many times did the Lord say bless in that verse? <laughs> it's, it's so thorough. It's so thorough. Every family of the earth will be blessed through Abram. Continuing here. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 15. Here's the one that was given the promise. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram at a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought them outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted to, to him for righteousness. Abram was an old man. His wife passed the years of childbearing. He had a faithful servant, Eliezer. Maybe Eliezer would be the one, but no. And Abram and Sarah tried to help the Lord out. And boy, did they mess it up. All too often, we try to do the same thing. Lord, I'm going to help you out. I know your, your word says something like this, but maybe if I... Don't listen to that. What a sad conclusion. But the promise still came. How long did Abram, then Abraham, have to wait for the promise? It doesn't say exactly. A really long time. He was not in his prime of life. But the promise still came. 
And he believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So again, for us, as we go through our lives, as we, you know, we face different issues, different opportunities, we walk by faith. We must walk by faith and continue to uphold each other, help each other, keep the faith. Remember how God has worked in your past. He's answered your prayer. He's delivered you by the angels. He's protected you from the enemy's plan. And as you continue to live your life, hold on to the promise. The promise will continue to be there. Whether or not you grab for it, the promise will continue to be there. I want to look at another aspect of the promise that God has for his children. And this passage is in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Remember I was talking about some longer passages of scripture. Jeremiah 31, we're going to read verses 3 through 12. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines, and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines in the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise and let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and the one that with labors with child together. A great throng shall return there. They shall come with weeping. And with supplications, I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off and say, He who scattered Israel will gather them. And keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming in to the goodness of the Lord. For wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be like well-watered gardens. And they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together. For I will turn their mourning to joy, will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. I don't know about you, but that is quite a promise. I think that is an absolutely astounding promise. That is a small glimpse of what God wants to do. All humanity brought, brought to the holy city. He will shepherd us. It 
it's really the ultimate cause for celebration, right? The ultimate. Keep in mind, our situations are very temporary here. Very temporary here. They are opportunities for us to establish our personal relationship with Jesus. That is the reason for our situation. That is why we need to walk by faith. That's why the substance may not be there. The evidence may not be seen. But I know my Redeemer lives. And I will be with him on that day. Continuing, I want to look at another glimpse of the promise coming true. And this one is in 2 Thessalonians. Because we are not quite there yet. There is more, more coming. More struggles, more strife. More blessings. More opportunity. More uh, seeing God's faithfulness. More promises brought to remembrance. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in the mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. It, it's coming. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the works of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous uh, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To which he called you by our gospel. For the ordain ordaining of the gospel, of the glory, excuse me, for the ordaining, my apologies, I'm going to start again at 14. To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. There are still struggles ahead. 
the man of sin, sure, we may recognize it. It has not yet reached its pinnacle of deception. More is going to unfold. More and more we need to live by faith. More and more we need to understand the word of God. More and more we need to remember the promises. More and more we need to look up instead of out. We really do. It's not going to get easier, but it's going to get better. <laughs> you know, if your relationship with the Lord is strong, there's a promise for you. He will keep you in perfect peace. His mind is stayed upon him. Where is your mind? What are you thinking of, thinking on? Do you want to be in perfect peace? Keep your mind stayed on Christ. In closing, I would like to look at one more passage in Scripture here, and that's in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14. Excuse me, 12 through 14. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of uh, that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Are you doing it alone? We're not doing it alone, are we? This verse says that Christ Jesus has also laid hold of it to you and to, and to me. Verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So there's some action to do, right? We're pressing forward. And by God's grace, he'll be with you every step of the way. So I encourage us to walk by faith.